In the interest of time, we'll go ahead and, and get started. Um, thank you all for coming today. So what we want to talk about today is pulse xenon ultraviolet. So this is a, a unique type of ultraviolet that um, is used to disinfect surface, surfaces in the hospital environment. So full disclosure, I am um, the chief scientific officer for Xenix, and we make one of these devices. I'm also an epidemiologist. So what I'm going to do is talk about the research program that we laid forth in the US. There's about 16 studies that have been published. Um, we're in about 300 hospitals in the US, and some of our research partners are like MD Anderson Cancer Center and the Mayo Clinic. So I'm going to give a, a brief overview of the research and kind of the questions we've asked about how uh, automated disinfection can work in the hospital setting. And then Dr. Ian Hussein is here with us. Um, he is a Director of Infection Prevention and Control. Um, he was at NHS Queens when we did this hospital. Now he's at King's Lens, and he'll talk about a deployment there and a study they did um, here in England. So that's the overview. I already did that. Um, so first, very quickly, the, the, the pathogens we're interested in. We're interested in a full range of pathogens. But as with chemical disinfection, with UV disinfection, if you can kill C. diff, you basically can kill everything else. And so we design our protocols around um, a C. diff kill. So that's a four-minute C. diff cycle. Um, we're also interested in norovirus. We're interested in the gram negatives. We're interested in the full range of pathogens. And what's great about UV, it is broad spectrum across all of those bacterial pathogens and viruses, it will impact them. And the way it works is it, it impacts the DNA or RNA of the organisms. So the first question we kind of thought about when we were designing this, the system and the research around it is where are the pathogens? What, what areas of the hospital should we be addressing? Do we need to worry about the floor? Do we need to worry about the ceiling? Or do we want to focus on the high touch surfaces? And what we decided, and there, there are multiple studies about this, that show that the high touch surfaces, they're really where the pathogens concentrate. If you go into a room and do a TSA plate or an aerobic bacterial sample, you'll find a pretty even spread of bacteria. But if you go and do selective sampling, if you go and look for MRSA, VRE, CRE, you're going to find it concentrated in the high touch surfaces. So we designed our system to focus on those high touch surfaces. Because what we want to do is we want to, we want to disinfect effectively and quickly and move on to the next room. We have to do a, a good volume of area in order to have an impact. So that was one of the first questions. Of course, how long do the pathogens survive? And much like this weed, they survive a really long time. And every time I see this chart, it seems to be getting longer. We seem to be finding pathogens um, surviving in the environment, in the hospital environment, for more and more time. So we're looking at, you know, as we focus on C. diff, we're looking at five or six months. So if you look at a hospital, there's going to be this buildup of the reservoir of C. diff in those rooms over, over a long period of time. So if I just do the C. diff isolation rooms, that's not sufficient. I have to hit that reservoir if I'm going to impact the rates. Um, well, isn't housekeeping good enough? The, you know, that's a question. This, this I, in the US, there's a, a researcher, Philip Carling, did extensive research on this, a lot of tracking the surfaces with UV dye and all that. And basically, due to external pressures, just sort of human error, we find about 50% of the surfaces, the high-touch surfaces, are actually, actually disinfected at the terminal clean moment. So housekeeping is inadequate. There's a lot of pressures on them. They're human beings. It's, it's a difficult thing. Um, so when we get into the UV technology, there, there are two ways of producing UV. One is xenon and one is mercury. And they produce different types of UV. And this is important as you, as you engage with this literature on UV disinfection, be very aware of this difference. So xenon gas produces a high intensity, broad spectrum of UV. It covers the entire germicidal spectrum, whereas a mercury-based system will produce a narrow spectrum at 253.7. That has differences. So I don't, I'm happy to go into this after with anyone who wants to go in detail. But basically, organisms, as you can see on this slide, they, it can be up to nine times, wavelengths in here can be up to nine times more effective than wavelengths in this area. And that's very important when we look at how do we create a dose that's going to impact these organisms. The other thing is those higher energy wavelengths can impact the cells in different ways. So it can fuse DNA and create what's called a photodimer, a photodimerization. But it can also do damage to a cell wall and create functional damage. So this is a xenon exposed organism. This is, um, I think, Listeria and E. coli. And this is a mercury exposed. So you won't have the functional damage. 
It also has a difference in how it's compatible with the materials. So when you pulse the xenon light, the amount of exposure time is actually measured in seconds. So in a five minute exposure, you only have a few seconds of actual UV on time versus a continuous exposure. So we've seen damage in materials in hospitals and OR. So that, that picture on the left is a, a monitor. The front of it was exposed to mercury UV and the rear was not. And you can see the difference. So then we got to the, the question, how should, how should this be used in an in a, a OR? So we went, or I'm sorry, in um, ORs and in patient rooms. So we did this study at um, both at MD Anderson and then it was re replicated at the VA, the VA system in, in Texas. And basically we, we have a multiple position protocol for most rooms. So in an OR it'll be two positions. In a, patient, a large individual patient room it'll be one in the bathroom and one on either side of the bed. And then in an empty bed space it would be one position inside that curtained area. So we've, we've gone and, and sampled the environment and, and sampled the high touch surfaces to see the impact of the different protocols. How does it compare to housekeeping? This was done at MD Anderson. Um, and basically, it's, it's, it's about 20 times better than housekeeping. So you look at the HPC count after housekeeping, and then you bring in the, the, the UV device, and we're able to achieve a, a higher level of decontamination in the environment. Is it dependent on housekeeping? We just said housekeeping doesn't always clean. What happens on surfaces that aren't first cleaned by housekeeping? Um, as long as the surface is visually clean, the UV is able to penetrate any kind of oils or dust that are on the surfaces. So we're not dependent on housekeeping to hit every single surface in the room. And so our minimum protocol is that the room be visually clean and then the UV disinfection can be brought in. Um, and that's, that's where I just jumped here. What is the minimal clean? The minimal clean is visual clean. There's been actually a couple of studies done this, on this with, um, at the VA, where they do you know, no manual cleaning or, or limited manual cleaning, or they change the cleaning protocols in order to, and, they, and they're basically asking the question, if we add um, automatic disinfection, if we add pulsing on UV into the room, can we remove anything else in the process without losing any quality in terms of the level of contamination? So those studies were, you know, most of them were published in AGIC, and the author in those, and, and afterwards, if anyone wants the, the reference list and all that, I'll be just outside those doors. So I'm happy to give those, those studies to you. Um, but, but basically, they were able to create a protocol that not only gave a better decontamination than the manual clean, but was about 23% faster. So that's, that's important as we look into throughput. Um, we did do a comparison with bleach, with sodium hypochlorite, and this was also at MD Anderson, and they, they found that you know, pulse xenon disinfection reduced the amount of C. diff contamination in the room by 85%, so this is environmental samples, whereas bleach was about 70% reduction in the amount of C. diff on the high touch surfaces. Based on this, in 2013, they stopped using bleach for C. diff isolation cleans and, and used pulse xenon instead and they've been monitoring their rates and, and actually we're, we're seeing a drop in rates and then they changed their diagnostics from toxin AB to PCR and so we, we, we can't publish a study on that but they've, they've monitored the rates and saw them drop. But the big question, so all that's great. Yeah, so here's what happens in the environment. It's, it's well known and well established that UV can decontaminate organisms, affects organisms, but what does it mean for rates? So we've gone off into hospitals, where again, we're in about 300 hospitals in the US, and these studies have been published looking at the reduction of, in this case, MRSA. This is the reduction of hospital-acquired infection rates. So these are actual reductions in rates. These are on the, the JIP study was in three hospitals, uh, multi-facility, multi and this was in um, one hospital in a, a system in Florida. But they were seeing these dramatic reductions in rates. What we see, and I think this is important for best practice, what we see happening here is not about just adding disinfection to the isolation and clean. It's about, again, disinfecting the unit, disinfecting the whole ward on a routine basis. That's what's going to impact the rates. Doing zero to two or doing some, just a little bit here and there in a facility every day isn't going to have an impact on rate. We've got to do more disinfection. We've got to make it a routine part of the cleaning. C. diff, of course, very, a lot of interest in C. diff. What is the rate there? So we've seen um, between a 53 and 70 percent reduction in C. diff rates has been published. The 70 percent reduction looked at a very intense deployment on ICUs. So they were, they were discharging, you know, they were disinfecting every single room at discharge. They were disinfecting staff areas, equipment areas. We were able to see an impact on the, the environmental decontamination 
and the rate of C. diff infection. A number of other studies, one that's not up here that's in press right now is from the Mayo Clinic who did a controlled study. They, did, they had three control units and three intervention units. And in the intervention units, they saw a 38% drop in C. diff, and on the control units, they actually saw a, during a, about a 22% increase on the control units. So, that, so we've, we're, we're starting to move into more experimental design studies. Um, SSI, surgical side infections, so these just have come out. Um, two studies came out. One looks at the rate of um, SSIs or orthopedic procedures. So in the year before, that's this one here. In the, in the year before Xenix, um, before they brought in Pulsinon, it was uh, seven infections, seven hip and knee infections, and after bringing in Pulsinon, they went to zero. They, they experienced no more infections. The other one looks, separated the, the infections between class one and class two surgical site incisions, class two being clean contaminated. So the wounds contaminated for some reason, whereas class one is a clean wound. And as a, you know, the, the theory here is the clean wound, if there is an infection, is more likely to be associated with an environmental pathogen that, that was entered during the surgical procedure. And they saw about a 45% reduction in the class one surgical site infections. This is, do, this is the use here was basically disinfecting the OR with pulsing on nightly. So two positions, every OR, every night. And that was the intervention. Uh, we've moved into other areas like long-term care and skilled nursing, some more complex areas um, in terms of the patient flow, and we've also seen reductions published in, in there. So this is about a 45% reduction in, um, again, C. diff at, um, this rate of C. diff infection at a long-term care facility. Actually, I'm sorry, 57% reduction. And um, the final couple pieces here are, you know, so we, we went into a, a BSL-4 lab and tested directly against Ebola. And so in the Ebola test, it was one meter. That was as big as the lab could go. Um, so we were one meter out, and in, in a one-minute cycle time, we, it was a total kill of the Ebola. And the minimum detection threshold there is about a four-log reduction. We also did anthrax, so that, that's the total kill there. So again, one, one meter distance from the device, one-minute runtime, was a, it, it was a total kill of the Ebola, minimum of four-log reduction for anthrax. We also did a similar test, but we ran for 15 minutes. Anthrax is very difficult to kill. And it was also a total kill, a minimum of a three log reduction on the detection th threshold. This was done at a lab called, um, it's called Texas Biomed. It's one of a handful of BSL-4 labs in the United States. And then we calculate, you know, it's always, money's always very important. And so we, we calculate for our customers and, and for the users of Pulsina on, you know, the, the ROI. And typically it's about a five month return on investment. And we factor in the labor and the, f the full model, the full deployment of the system. And we look at that against the savings from the prevented infections. And that is all I have. So I've handed over to Dr. Hussain who can speak about UK setting. Mark, is it the, uh, the top one here, is it? <coughs> top one? <coughs> yes, that's yes, it. Right. Well, thank you very much. So Dr. Stibik has gone through uh, quite a lot of information very quickly, and that is deliberate. I will also be quite quick because we'd like to engage with you at the end, and we will leave about maybe 10, 15 minutes to, to do that. Um, Ian Hussain, I'm the Dipsy at Queen Elizabeth Hospital, uh, Associate Medical Director for Quality Improvement. And just for uh, disclosure purposes, uh, this study, was partly funded by Sodexo Healthcare, uh, who gave us money for the laboratory supplies, uh, and also Sodexo kindly provided the Xenex device on loan for us. So the, Dr. Stibik showed slides regarding Ebola virus and uh, anthrax, and you know, the question is why in our setting? I'm the first Dipsy ever appointed in this country uh, that's a matter of fact, and that goes back to well before Lean Donaldson ever heard the word Dipsy. So I want to take you back a bit to the 1990s. And if the question was asked around early 1993-94, how important is the environment to IP and C? The answer would be not that much. Aspergillus, construction, Remember, this is still an HIV era, so cryptococcus, pigeon droppings, every hospital <coughs> has some pigeon dropping somewhere. And you get, you know, 
a few uh, concerns about super shadows, um, you know, the cloud baby syndrome with the environment having staff warriors. Uh, one of my colleagues in the US, Robert Charette, published on the cloud adult syndrome. So the idea of skin scrape. So we had all that. Now the question, if it is asked now, how important is the environment for infection prevention and control? The data has been enormous. You have anecdotal studies, the work of Noble, looking at VRE, patient is in, has VRE, gets a problem with contamination. In fact, it's quite a humorous one where Noble said that this patient was self-caring, interestingly, in an intensive care unit, probably ready for step down. There was no toilet paper. So he used the hand towels. The toilet flooded, as happens. They decontaminated the room completely as by standard methods, manual clean and a hypochlorite. The next patient got VRE. So we have anecdotes, but we have enormous amounts of data. So what I'm going to do is, and I will, the emphasis in, in, in this work, uh, you will see the data from uh, Queen's Hospital in Rumford, and you will also see the work from uh, Kingsland. The reason I mentioned the Dipsy position and alcohol gel, which I brought in, on the basis of not just a technical imperative, this is 1996, but a behavioral imperative. So we have this idea that hospitals are places where the natural sciences dominate. That is nonsense. People come to work with their concerns. They come to work with Brexit in their mind. They come to work with gas prices. They come to work with all these things. And of course, we have a problem with the NHS with staffing. Uh, we have a problem with the elderly care. We have a problem with money. We have a lot of problems in the NHS. Those don't go away when you come to work. And we have to deal with the fact that we have patients in beds and we have nowhere to send them to. So you will see in this presentation as a preamble, the technical dimension, does UVC kill in our environment? Because we have different paints, we have a different hospital. A lot of this work was done at MD Anderson. But you know, it's a reasonable question. Does it really work in our environment? But you also see some of the social sciences coming in. Alcohol gel, I said, I brought in because there's only one company that had alcohol gel in 1996, and that was Diverse Oliva. They had no market. I asked 2,000 people in Cardiff, why don't you wash your hands? And I'm still waiting for the Nobel Prize for that. And they said, we don't do it because we hate your hand washing agent. This is published, uh, chlo um, the chlorhexidine the heavy scrub. Many of our healthcare workers are female, nurses are mainly women. The women care about their hands more than men. And if you give them rough paper towels, they hate it. So I had a, an issue of where I had a, a marketing need, an imperative to give staff members something more. And we had alcohol gel. I asked them what you talked about. And some people like the smell quite a lot. Anyway, that's how you get it. So anyway, that, that's the preamble. So with that, uh, the first three authors are from Queen's Hospital. The last three are from the Texas system, including the veteran administration system and so forth. And just moving on then, so what did we try to do? Well, we, there we go. So these were our study aims. The first two can be regarded as technical. Does it kill? And the data that Dr. Stibich mentioned, if we did biosampling before cleaning, after cleaning, manual cleaning, by standard methods with a hypochlorite, standard UK methods. And then we applied the uh, ultraviolet device using the protocol given by the company. What do we find in terms of bioreduction? Do we find anything at all? And to what extent do we find bioreduction? The work from MD Anderson is a different hospital. Uh, they have a problem with VRE, which is why they published on VRE. Uh, when we dealt with is Ian Gould here. When we talked about VR in the early 1990s, we thought the curve was going to be up and up and up. And that did not happen. So we don't have a bigger problem, as bigger problems now with VR other than the, the bigger uh, centers. Um, but you can still, I guess, I'm trying to argue that you cannot extrapolate directly from one to one. We don't have a VR problem. Uh, some of the microbiologists from Queens are here. We didn't have a VR problem there other than the one admission. So what we did here was to, to simulate. Well, if we did have it, if we did have CPE, 
CRE in the United States, MR, Acinetobacter, what would the impact be? Because you know, not all resistant organisms are the same, so can we make an assumption? Notwithstanding the way that Dr. Stibik has presented, we wanted a test. If we exposed it, agar plates spiked with these with a significant inoculum, what would it do? What would uh, the device do? And the last two are why I mentioned money. Dr. Stibik mentioned this. Mortgages. All of us here, if we work in the, the hospital system or affiliated with it, will know we have a major crisis in this country right now. And if we don't get it right, the NHS is at risk. The NHS that we know and are very proud of is at risk. Everybody will accept that. So unless we deal with the reality of money, throughput, beds, we will not come to grips. Uh, and the question is, how do we interface this? You know, can, is there some way of bringing some sort of harmonization between these tensions, a technical imperative, and the social dynamic? So here, uh, Rosie Madeloso, one of the investigators, is here uh, from Queens. We, we looked at, uh, Dr. Stewart mentioned the high touch, high environmental contamination areas. So the patient with diarrhea in a single room, as much as we may uh, try to control it, you will get contamination of high touch areas and so forth. So we combined the data, we looked at biosampling using uh, TSA contact plates uh, before as I described it, one, two, three. When you combine all that data for all of these various uh, sampling sites, for 39 rooms, you can see a reduction all the way from the initial uh, 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 pre-cleaning. These are, these are colony forming units, 50 millimeter contact plate averaged out. And you can see a reduction after standard terminal clean and further reduction after the PXUV. When you combine the data together, you see, based upon the initial contamination rate, above a 90% reduction by the time you get to PXUV. After terminal cleaning, 60%. So if we have VRE, CPE in those rooms, you can see the risk to the next patient immediately. Uh, this is the data on the spiked plates. So you have the organisms on the left. Uh, one, of the, one of my colleagues at Queen's uh, did uh, some of this data. Um, it was my decision that this would be done in a sluice room because uh, another study done in this country took spike plates onto an uh, intensive care unit. I, I wouldn't do that. Uh, some of the older microbiologists may remember using um, uh, pigmented serratia marcesins in the olden days looking at airborne spread and then because people got infected. So you don't, you don't take living organisms into a clinical area if you can. Human beings can carry but not plates. So we deliberately did it in a sluice room. It's a contaminated area already. Uh, and of course, the, so the plates were put in there. They were spiked uh, four feet away. Remember, the Xenex device is pulsing circumferentially. So four feet does not mean one direction only. And that is the uh, outcome you see on the right-hand side, five log reduction, so a significant kill. So, you know, roughly a million organisms down to one. To have a million organisms residual post-cleaning would be catastrophic. So if you had a situation where you're going, you know, room or bay or whatever it is, clean it and then this device, you're not starting off with that level of contamination. You're starting off with a lot less. This is now going into the social dynamic. So, you know, we've got to get people out of rooms quickly. We have to clean the rooms as quickly as we could. So we measured, and I think this is one of the few studies that actually did this. Uh, most of it just looks at the, the, the technical or the outcome. You know, do you see a rate of reduction? But we looked at the total transport time, which includes uh, getting the device out from storage and then waiting time to use it. So this is cleaning still going on. You could see room for uh, improvement right there. Then you have the in-room uh, uh, in use time, which is an irreducible amount, because that is manufacturer-driven by the technology. Then you have time taken back to 
uh, storage. Or one can argue, why do we measure this figure at 60 minutes? Because I guess we have to imagine if we had one device, Queens with two floors, taken back to storage. So if somebody calls and said, can we get the device now? If we had to do that cycle, it's one hour. But one can see that if you had proximal storage, if you had a device ready to roll, proximal to a particular ward, so you can go left or right as at Queens, then a number of opportunities in there for truncating that time are clear. Both the time to bring it up and the time to get it to another ward. Uh, I mean, in a faster throughput era, you probably go ward to ward. So that data says 60 minutes, but as I said, there's a lot of t time in there that we could truncate. This is now talking to the, <coughs> I need uh, five more minutes, uh, because we do want to get some um, questions at the end. So this is now talking to the people who actually use the device, just three people, but we've extended that at, at Kingsland. And one cannot assume that that device that you will see out there is easy to move. Who says it is? Can we assume that? Ergonomics are important. People get back pain. So we, we ask them. I mean, that's not unreasonable. Uh, uh, um, so we asked them, um, so the top three are the device operators. Was it easy? Was the setup uh, easy? Was it comfortable? You know, you're pushing it around, etc. And they were very, very uh, uh, favorable in terms of their responses. They thought it was very easy and so forth. In terms of ward staff, it's a busy ward. These, uh, NHS is, 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 you know, to say it as fast would be a mild statement. You're putting it on the ward. Is it disruptive? Is it obstructive? There's a, de you know, can you move around it, etc. So when you ask 12 staff at Queen's Hospital, uh, all thought it was non-disruptive, didn't cause any noise, uh, etc. Uh, only one person thought it impacted on uh, throughput. Turn it on time, and this was done in our busiest units. This was done in the, in the medical admission. So you, you can't get busier than MAU. And despite being an MAU, they felt the throughput was pretty fast. In fact, a couple of people even said they thought it was even faster, because when they called the cleaners, it just kicked in very quickly. The whole process kicked in. So, um, so at Queen's, these are the study highlights. Uh, the, the bio reduction was significant, ward staff liked it. At King's Lynn, <coughs> slightly different approach. Uh, we deployed the devices routinely for isolation rooms in February of 2015. And the question that comes up is, well, did you see any outcome figures? What, what happened with Nora? What happened with C different and so forth? The norovirus curve was significant compared but just at Queens, I mean, we dropped it to a flat line. But many interventions were going in. The dipsy position proves that one does not just have technologies, how you interface technology. No device tells me to wash my hands. I mean, you would tell me, but I still mightn't do it. No device tells me, take my glove off, even if you tell me I mightn't do it. Uh, will I break the speed limit, even though it's 30 miles an hour? Which, how, this is the, the mental function has to be addressed. So. We, we, we introduced it. Uh, we're also in special measures, for those of you not in the UK, so we have accreditation bodies, inspection bodies, and Queen Elizabeth Hospital, this is King's was in special measures, meaning we're doing badly, patient safety, etc. As part of our initiative to get out of special measures, 50 interventions went, I don't mean infection control, I mean the entire organization, a big push. But this device was part of that push. And it's interesting to see it, uh, what did people say? So just a bit about outcome data. So this was the awareness in the organization about the trial. Then lots of posters went up and so forth because there's a big push about the CQC and everything else. And you see, we got very close to the baseline here, one, zero, one, one, and something happened here. Did this device lead to a reduction in C. difficile cases? <coughs> I think. <coughs> It certainly may have helped, but I do want to emphasize this is only in our isolation rooms. We have bays with people going in and out. And of course, the bays may have carriers that are unknown, so you get contamination, you get shared toilets, etc. You have members of staff who are walking around with gloves. The epidemic of glove usage in the NHS, have you seen it? They walk around, they touch, they touch, they touch. This device is not decontaminating their hands. So now that what happened here? Well, we took 
our foot off the bricks. We got out of special measures. We did spectacularly well. The entire organization was amazing. Then some of the monitoring on the walls regarding, I'm talking about safety now, medication error, the red pinny, the red, uh, have you seen them? The one that says, do not disturb me on my drug rounds. So coming up to the CQC, everybody had the red pinny on. Is that a right term? Tab out, some people said tab out. Everybody had it on. CQC goes away, you go on the wards. Excuse me, where, where is your um, red pinny? Oh, we run out. We are not allowed to do the drug run without that red pinny on. You gotta get it, you borrow it, you buy it, you steal it. You don't do it. So coming up to the CQC, I'm trying to show you how that entire dynamic of quality improvement moves together. The technology was still there, but in some regards, it, it cannot deal with... So if the question to us would be, can we bring this in, does it work, this data saying it works? In the United States, the standard is a single rule. The standard is a single rule. So it may be that some of the American data is showing efficacy because the single rule became the limiting factor for transmission because they got, the other things were right. Yep, in our situation, the single room is not the standard. We have bays, we have 90 gig wards, we have transmission going on elsewhere, etc. So that is interesting figures. We've dropped it back down again with multi-input interventions. I don't like the word bundling. One does not bundle human beings. Human behavior is not bundleable. The human mind is what created quantum mechanics. I talked about this last night. You don't bundle people. So I, when people talk about bundling, we don't bundle. We intervene. Right. So. A couple of comments here in just two minutes. The social imperative. People are worried about their jobs. People are worried about that we just went through a doctor's strike. This is the NHS. So when you talk to them, what about your job? I was worried. But once people explained to me what the device did, not a problem. How did other people react to you? They're very impressed. In fact, they said, you know, us cleaners, they think we're stupid. We're not stupid. And now that we understand the environment, it was a bundle, I used to a bundle. We, 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 we went in and we educated them. So what I'm saying is that it wasn't just a device. It is, do you understand what CDF is? Do you understand the spores, what a spore is? So part of that intervention, including with Xenex support, because the technical people for Xenex were there to talk about ultraviolet light, but my team, the IPNC nurses were all there, training as well, doing more and more and more. And that combined effort meant that we got some cleaners who were amazing, because they were on the floor, they'd be stopped by relatives, oh, what's this? I saw it in the papers, I saw it in the newspaper, and they say, you know, it made us feel very proud that we could explain what ultraviolet light was doing. Did that have an impact in our getting out of special measures? Our staff say it did. They said the fact that we brought in technology as innovation, technology that's cutting edge, technology that said we mean business. Interesting one doesn't really kill gyms. So you have people who are, remember, you have a faster troop of the staff, so you have to go back out there and tell them again what's working, what isn't working. Uh, did the device help with our CQC preparations? They say yes. Uh, room decontamination. I trust the device more because of the variation I see. That's what they're saying. So the Carling study that Dr. Stilick mentioned didn't say cleaners were bad. It just said that if we don't train them, teach them, monitor them, they can't do a good job. So when Carling intervened with more training, teaching, they did do a better job. The problem is we can't do that all the time. We, you know, so the, the, the variation is in there. So this is not saying that if you have hypochlorite, good cleaners. So Jean-Yves and I, uh, Cardiff did uh, some studies looking at wipes, yep, yeah, to the epidemic of wipes. We got wipes, we, we, we brought, you know, as part of the initiative around wipes, but people misuse wipes. So you can undermine things very easily if you don't use them properly. Right, anyway, so uh, concerns, why do the cleaners just hang around when the device is going? Well, I don't know, I mean, it's 20 minutes, but you know, I guess we're, we're so busy. Okay, so with that, um, let me summarize where we are at, at King's Lynn. And, and, and so uh, the, the Queen's Rumford work says technically it works. Our paintwork, our rooms, our infrastructure, our beds, moving it around the rooms in the United States. So it does work. Um, and the, the King's Lynn work is saying the device is very well received. It's easy to use. Staff members in the wards liked it. Cleaners liked it. I think with that, uh, Mark, if you could come back up now. and. Uh, I'll end there. So we're happy to now take any questions regarding this device, or technical or otherwise. So our, our, our people, yeah, sorry. What's the area limit for that? What is the area limit for 
So, so in the in the labs, we've tested out four meters from the device for vegetative bacteria like MRSA. What we typically do is, as we come in and look at an area, if the if the target range is more than about two and a half meters, we'll consider it. That's that's the moment where we consider adding another position. You know, so it's, it's usually faster to add a second position than to run longer for the time. But the the limit, you know, in the lab, we've gone four meters. So that would be an eight meter diameter of a of a, of a radius around the device. So are people close to, to, to making their seed of targets this year? I mean, it's becoming more and more difficult, isn't it? The targets keep on dropping and dropping, and of course, MRAC is now zero. How is anybody here be under pressure to deliver a target? Or is it everybody not putting up their hands? <laughs> Any questions? Any comments? Corinne, do you have any comments to make? Kareem, Cameron, Watson at the back, if you could just give it a uh, microphone. Yeah, Kareem. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'd just like to say that um, at our trust, we now have um, the ability to uh, purchase uh, some of the machines. So they'll be coming online within our trust as standard. The Xenex devices. Yes. OK, right. Comments, queries? Anybody under pressure to bring in a, a technology like this? Hey, there's, there's a, a, a quick question, actually. I mean, I've got quite a lot of questions, <laughs> actually. But um, I just wondered how the energy output compared to continuous UV? So it, it's, it's going to be, it's a, it's a tricky and technical question, and we can, we can talk offline. The, the, the energy is converted into a higher energy UV, so the electrical energy, because we're covering the full spectrum of, of the deployment of UV. So it's not, a, it's not something you can compare spectrum by spectrum, the, the UV. So, but I'm happy to chat about that after, yeah. Uh, my question was just how important is the pulsing part of the UV light rather than a continuous light? Well, so the, the pulsing, what, it, what it's doing is that we're, we're pulling energy in from the wall and storing it up and then bursting it out in a, in a high intense burst. Certain organisms like C. diff there's a, what we call a, a, a dose threshold. And if you don't overcome that, if you don't have enough of an intensity, um, you won't be able to have an impact on those organisms. So as you get into a room with reflectivity, that pulsing or that intensity of the light is important. When you move from, and, and I think we see it more when you move from a lab study where things are in direct exposure to the actual rooms where the surfaces can have crevices and cracks and they can be at angles and all that, that's where I think the intensity comes into play much more. And, and, and a final comment, and, and what we're seeing more and more, and it's not, it's not surprising, it's very predictable, is the, the, the concept of dose response. And, and basically, the more the robots are used, and, and we're hoping to get them used more and more in the NHS facilities, the more they're used, the more area that's disinfected, the more impact there will be on rate. So it's, a, it's that operationalizable, it, it's getting them out there, getting them into routine use, that's going to make a difference on the rates. Any other questions? Yeah, hello, I'm one of the infectious disease consultants in Public Health England. Have you tried it in the community? Probably I missed the slide with respiratory. We have lots of respiratory outbreaks in the community. And then when it goes to trust, they blame each other. It came from community or community said the, the trust sent it. Anything about like flu viruses and the rest? You had some data in the community, didn't you? Right. So we're, we're moving now from the you know, acute care setting into um, post-acute care, long-term care, skilled nursing, those areas. And we, we see impact in both skilled nursing and long-term care. In terms of the pre-acute care, you know, nursing homes and, and patients that might be coming in, uh, we're, we're starting in there. It's, um, it's all, you know, in the, in the U.S., in that case, it's a, it's a business and financial you know, what is the business model for those facilities to come online? But we are starting to do some studies in the on both sides of the acute care and seeing results. I think, I think if, if I can comment a little bit about the, the, the reservoir and the community, absolutely right, isn't it? That, that there's so much measuring that goes on the acute sector, the targets of the acute sector. Yet we know the human population is principally outside. Antibiotics, Chorchip was mentioned in the last presentation, the bulk of agents are used in the community. So unless we get the grip with nursing homes, long-term care facilities, we're not having a holistic intervention. You're absolutely right about that. And of course, it's not just the case, it's the carrier, isn't it? Many of these elderly patients, the typing studies show this. If you type and you see multiple types, it does not mean to see you don't have cross-infection. It just means that the typing you've had from the eyes which you have 
at length, but the unknown who used that commode before, who was in that room before. That is why one of the questions would be asked, if we have standard terminal clean for all rooms, because that is an option, if you're going to do it for the one that you know, why aren't you doing it for the one you don't know? Because they, they could be carriers as well, you see. So the question would be, can technology like this be deployed routinely for all rooms? And one of the questions asked of, of, uh, of me uh, in our quality of studies, somebody said, can you get us a bigger one to do base? Because of course they know, although we're meant to isolate in a single room, we don't have enough. We've got somebody dying. Well, where will we put this patient? So we try to manage them in a, in a bay. They may, be, uh, they may not be self-caring, so you've got the bedpan, but still you're putting them in a bay. And that bay now is contaminated, uh, and so the question would be, can we deploy devices like this to give us that level of assurance? I think one of the comments as well has to do with that word assurance, isn't it? With the unknown, CPE and so on, how sure are we? With the variation, which is the buzzword in quality management, can, can this give us, despite the best efforts with cleaning and staff training and induction, we have staff members coming into the NHS, we have them in Kings Lynn, highly skilled from abroad, highly trained, excellent with, 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 with uh, venous access, but they wear gloves too much. They walk around with gloves and they don't clean commodes, because in their country, it's not something they do. So you have this variation that's continual, do we then put patients at risk because of our inability to deal with that variation, or do we make patients safer by something that's a bit more assured? So that's, a, that's an important point. 